Yeah, over the years, but not that many people that did compare to you. A lot of people, the tourists rather just go to the little park and play their, buy their bucket and, because uh, it's hard work. It's like the, you know, like gold, hunting for gold, gemstones. It, it is really hard work. And you've got to be keen on doing hard work or, you, you know, you're not going to find anything. Pretty laid back, you know. There's no rushing, there's no yeah, haste and that sort of thing. Pretty, pretty wild, wild place. Dry, but it's still beautiful. You can no longer ask the question, where do I find gems? Because the truth is, the gems are where you find them. This land once known as a crow's treasure trove is now seriously lacking in what once made it famous. But the determination of man is one of his most astounding achievements. And when you're drunk, everything sounds like a good idea. So we said, fuck it, let's do it anyway. So we come out to Rubyvale in central Queensland. <laughs> we come out to Rubyvale in central Queensland to look for our fortunes, and maybe we'll learn a little something on the way too. So buckle up, buccaneers. Chuck on your fucking, chuck on, chuck your, get your boots on. We're heading west. Let's go. Let's go look for gems. Yeah. My name is Jimmy Stitt. In the 90s, I used to hate my life as a guitarist for the rock band Jackal, so I left it all behind and moved to Brisbane, Australia. Now there are only three things that I love. Smoking doobies, making movies, and finding big rubies. This is Jimmy Stitt's History Fix. This part of Earth is so remote, it almost seems untouched. At night, the stars are so bright, they illuminate the landscape. An eerie silence blankets the area, broken only by the unbridled laughter and girthy words of amateur miners. Even in the ramshackle accommodations that dot the hills around us, barely a peep can be heard. For somewhere so quiet, you can hear a pin drop, it's remarkable. We've arrived here in winter, so we can expect temperatures to drop to around 7 degrees every night. During the day, we'll be enjoying pleasant weather hovering around the mid-twenties, but in the summer, temperatures here can skyrocket to 45 degrees. Kangaroos and brumbies dominate the land as eagles and kookaburras perch themselves atop the trees, surveying the ground for the next meal. In spite of the remote, rugged, and often harsh environment of the gem fields, this area has drawn thousands of people in search of their fortunes for almost 150 years. In order to understand what made this town notable, we have to look at the explosive beginning that birthed the area. It's 70 million years ago, and the Earth's surface is under enormous pressure from the mighty collision of drifting continents. From this geological generation of volcanic activation came forth not only ash and lava, but also peculiar little stones formed deep in our Earth's high pressure womb. Those little rocks were brilliantly clear crystals, each one having its own unique size, color, and composition. These little nuggets of joy settled in the lava that flowed around these ancient volcanoes, and over time they were washed out into the creeks and riverbeds that lined the area. And it was there that they stayed until the indecent theft of the continent by Great Britain. After surveyor Archibald John Richardson discovered red zircons in 1887, it didn't take long for word to spread about the find, and this spurred the birth of gem towns Anarchy, Retreat Creek and Policeman's Creek, with the latter two being renamed Sapphire and Rubyvale soon after. People flocked to the towns, and soon they were bustling mining centres. At its peak in 1921, Rubyvale was home to 603 residents. The popularity of the gem fields went into decline after 1935 as cheaper sapphires began to be sold from Africa. This hindered the sales of Australian gems enormously and the market didn't recover until the 60s when tourism and commercial mining spurred new interest in the area. Been in here for generations. Great great grandfather found the gem fields in 1887 I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. And then yeah just with my father done it was a, when I was a kid and grew up doing it and we're still yeah just taking over working with him and keeping it going. The machinery side of it, they started mining, I think, in the late 70s and 80s, and that's when the machinery commercial site really kicked off. Before that, it was all um, hand mining, which they got a lot of stone hand mining. Like, it was just a place they called Sultana Hill because it was just like picking sultanas out of a fruitcake, you know. They were just all over the ground. They just picked up bucketfuls. Well, a lot of the resources are exhausted out here, so there's still, there's still a lot of stone out here, but a lot of it is, and the demand dropped off in the... Uh, 
sort of the 90s, it dropped right off because Africa and that started getting them out a lot cheaper. And so the, the demand has picked up a lot. And for our coloured stone, because a lot of people only think sapphires are blue, you know, like there was a mentality that sapphires are blue, rubies are red, emeralds are green, diamonds are white. And now that we've got our different coloured stone and they are getting sapphires coming in every colour, but we, our party colours are really kicking off around the world and they were worth nothing for a very long time. One of the most notable sapphires to have come from this area is the Black Star of Queensland, the largest Black Star sapphire in the world. It was discovered by a 12 year old man in 1938 who, believing it to look rather unusual, took it home to his poor minor father, Harry Spencer. I found a big shiny rock. Oh, yeah? Give me a look. Could be a gem. Could be. Sapphires aren't black. Are you sure, Dad? Yeah, pretty sure. Okay. Good find, but maybe we'll use it as a doorstop. It was used as a doorstop for almost a decade until Spencer was told that sapphires can exist as black gemstones. Uh, no. Gem no money in gemstones anymore. I read the other day, mate. You know gemstones can be black? You know sapphires can be black? After weighing it and finding that it was an enormous 1,156 carats, he cleaned it up and began seeking prospective buyers. Can I help you? Uh, how to do, mister? Sorry to interrupt your evening, but uh, I heard through a friend of mine that you might have a stone you want looked at. A little bit bigger than others might have seen before. Yeah, I do. Well, let's, let's do, do it outside, mate. You look like a weirdo. My, my, that is a mighty fine rock if I must say so myself. Spencer sold the sapphire to 18,000 pounds, roughly equal to $200,000 in today's money, but even that is just a fraction of its $88 million value. It was later cut into a 733 carat oval cabochon, which reveals a brilliant six-pointed star when exposed to light. Well, there are lots of stories that you'll hear around here of people just happening to find giant jewels. It's not actually that common. It's more likely that you get eaten by a shark while being struck by lightning in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Having said that though, you can still find them and you just need to dig a big fucking hole like this guy's doing. First you need to scout the area and locate some geographical signposts to point you in the right direction. Large boulders and rounded stones give you a glimpse into an area's history. They tell you that creeks and rivers may have once flowed nearby. The gem's weight means that they sink in the water which causes them to become lodged underneath larger rocks. Each bucket needs to be pedantically screened to separate the rocks and sand from the gemstones. Most of what gets dug up is useless, destined to be dumped in several colourless piles. The finer rocks are collected and taken to get washed and sorted at the plant. feeling particularly dangerous, you could head down here into one of these tunnels. Thousands of kilometers of tunnels like these snake their way under the gem fields. And it's really, really cool to be this far underground, but it's also pretty scary. If this shit caves in around me, I'll be fucked. There is no way you're gonna be able to dig me out before I suffocate. So I think I'll stick to the surface. Once you finish fucking around with the rocks over there, you can bring them here, chuck them in big old Bessie. To explain how this plant works, I got my friends drunk. See how that turned out. All of this? Do I get more than everybody else? Smooth. Starts with morale. You know, a bunch of young fellas coming out of Brisbane and the Gold Coast. I'm from the coast, if you, if you don't know. Get the wheelbarrow, 
bring it over, bring it over to the hopper. No, we don't do that. <laughs> we get it in the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We take the gems out from underneath the shaker, throw it in the buckets, carry the buckets up to the. Uh, what's it called again? Hopper. A big green machine called Hopper. When you put it in, it comes down to a little funnel point. So you're using gravity to bring these stones down. Someone's there holding a little flappy door. It never finished. It's just. Yeah. <laughs> it feeds the rocks from the, the hover into the wash, no? Into the spinning thing. You, you catch your hand if you're not careful. And you go like this. And you watch it. Because otherwise you have to stare at the other guy. I'm not gonna lie. Taking some brain cells away. Yeah, and, and all this, all this, all this rocks, they fall down in this bubble system and, and the bubble system works. It's like, pushes all the dirt up. It's like, it goes like creating waves. Like, man, it, it pushes all the light stuff, like through these trays up and it brings all the sapphires because sapphires are heavier than rocks, you see? Sapphires are much heavier than rocks. So the sapphires fall to the bottom and all the light stuff just flows off the top through these four trays. We have four trays in the system. And uh, yeah, it's just fun as a rock. I am. It's a rock. I'm bubbled. I don't understand, but no problem. This is the stone that's um, out the back of the machine that you've got to shovel into a wheelbarrow. And from the wheelbarrow, it goes into a pile <laughs> down the bottom of the property. You know, like harvesting harvesting our soil with, 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 with the, the dirt that we hope to find, find our sapphires and gems and emeralds and rubies and, and, and putty stones and, 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 all kind of, and all kind of stones. Um, and then we, then we take it out and that's, that's pretty much the system. There's generally there's a bit of drama. You know, the pipe pops off or you're fucking... I really, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a bit of drama. <laughs> I lied. There's two more. Washing the stones yields a certain anticipation. The air is electric as everybody crouches over the fosking pen optimistically searching for the buried treasure that they've been desecrating their backs for. Occasionally, someone will pull out a rock, point it to the sky and proudly proclaim, that's a gem. Most of the time, it'll be quartz. The disappointment sends a lot of hopeful Foskers home with dirt in their mouths and dust in their wallets. And at the end of the day, if your hand isn't holding a gem, it'll most likely be holding a beer instead. I know what you're thinking. Jimmy, this sounds like lunacy. Why should I perch myself perilously upon a precarious platform placing pails of rocks into a makeshift mixing machine for four-fifths of fuck all of a chance of finding brilliant bijous? The thing is, if you put enough hard work and effort into it, you'll find them. We had six guys digging a big fuck off hole, and this is what we found. This is 270 carats of gems. At the end of a hard day of fosking, you'll find yourself dirty, tired, and probably ready for a beer. You might find yourself empty handed, and that's when the inevitable question arises. Was all the digging, shoveling, washing and wincing worth it? <laughs> sure, we could have headed to the jeweler and bought ourselves a gem, but that'd be too easy. No, if you want something truly special, you have to dig the hole yourself. Well, you know, you're not going to be a millionaire hand digging for sapphires. But you never know. You can walk and pick one up on the ground worth a million dollars. No, it's just uh, sapphires are where you find them. There's a sense of camaraderie in the struggle, not just between you and your mates, but also between anybody who's ever been here to do this before. 
digging big holes, finding big rubies, paying $10 for a Maxibon. These are things that can bring you to your knees. My hands are fucked. My back is so sore, I fear I may never walk again. But that's actually not what this is about. Because you see, once you start digging that hole, when you get down deep enough, you realize something. It's not actually about finding the rocks. It's about the experience that you get when you look for them. And when you realize that, when you accept that fact, a rock might just find you instead. And you'll have in your hands something so sentimentally valuable, you'll keep it forever. A splendid souvenir of a bloody great time. My name's Jimmy Stiff, and this has been a History Fix. Cheers. Oh, a peg. It brings a peg to the party. Mm. Landscape is covered in kangaroo shit. A um, lot of dirt, a lot of red dirt, a lot of pebbles. Some trees, but mostly dirt. Dirt is how I describe it. Dirt with a couple trees. Once you see something, you can never unsee it. And once you see these little bits of, you know, volcanic rock that is produced, you know, fucking, like, billion, like, like, years and years and years ago, they, um, yeah, the pressure forms these, these, like, crystallized, like, diamond, like, gems, and, I never found a gem out here. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's not here. Yeah, you know, I dug a hole so far down that it was so fucking warm that I couldn't, you know, I nearly melted. It. Fucking, it's insane. Bow, 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 bow. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah! All right, I'm out.